We've missed you. Pour yourself a drink, pop some popcorn, throw those wings in the oven, grab any snack. It is time to catch up over pre-show cocktails, or tea, or water, or whatever. Before the curtain rises at our favorite place, the Stratford Festival. Let's gab about the shows of the 2021 season, the plays, and the cabarets. This, this is show starters with Alexis and Ijoma. Cheers. Cheers. Hi there, my name is Alexis Gordon and welcome to Show Starters. We are about to meet with the creative team behind one of the cabarets for the 2021 Stratford Festival season. But before we do that, I would love to first acknowledge the land that we are all digitally connecting from. Niagara-on-the-Lake, Stratford, Toronto, and Peterborough. They are on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, the Attawandaran, the Mississauga, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, the Wendat, and Treaty 20 of 1880. 18. We are so grateful and thankful for the stewardship of these lands and recognize the long history of sharing stories on these lands as well. And as the brilliant Sam White and New York City's Women's Project Theatre has shone a light on for me this year, I would also like to acknowledge our privilege in having the accessibility to the internet, to computers, to our devices, in order to connect with each other as so many do not have that access or that privilege in this time. It is something we do not take for granted to be able to share our stories and our art with you now. Today, we are exploring freedom, the spirit and legacy of Black music, directed, curated, and performed by the incredible and the incredibly cool Bo Dixon. Program notes for the show have been written by the brilliant George Elliott Clark. Joining Bo in performance for the show will be Robert Ball, Alana Bridgewater, and Camille Younga Selenge. This is Bo Dixon's second season at Stratford. Bo is a self-taught award-winning actor, playwright, songwriter, sound designer, and music director. In Bo's first season at the Stratford Festival, he played Big Julie in Guys and Dolls, and Bo received a Toronto Critics Award for his role as the narrator in musical Stage Co. and Obsidian Theatre's rock musical, Passing Strange. And his original solo piece entitled Beneath Spring Hill, the Maurice Ruddick story garnered him two Dora Awards for Best New Play and Best Individual Performance and a Calgary Critics Award. George Eliot Clark is a revered poet and scholar of afro Mady roots out of Africadia. He founded the field of African Canadian literature, has poetry books translated into Chinese, Italian, and Romanian, has won Canadian, American, Chinese, and Romanian awards, holds eight honorary doctorates, plus appointments to the Order of Nova Scotia and the Order of Canada at officer rank. He has taught at Harvard and Duke and still owns three quarter acres of land, familial, in Nova Scotia, dating back to the colonial slave holding era. We're very excited to have George here today. And Bo, welcome you two. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Alexis. Hello. Now let's set the scene. If we were in Stratford today and we were having some pre-show cocktails, it's an hour before curtain, where where would we where would we be? Well, I'll just leap in and say I would be at the boar's head. Absolutely. And I would be having probably, I know I shouldn't say this to upset vegetarians, but I would definitely be having a bison burger. And I would likely also be indulging in a Negroni uh, cocktail, uh, which is, of course is Campari, Martini, Rosso and gin in the correct proportions with a slice of, of either lemon or orange on the side of my glass. Delicious. And I would hopefully uh walk into the boar's head and i would see george and i'd be george <laughs> do you mind if i join you and i would sit down beside him whether he liked it or not oh yeah <laughs> you're very welcome Bo. absolutely and, and, and I, what would I, you be ordering i would be ordering the wings i miss the wings at the boar's head hopefully uh the, the playoffs would be on the nba playoffs and um I'd grab myself a nice uh, bitter, uh, bitter ale, or a hoppy beer, but for now I have the Brimstone IPA. Amazing, amazing. Well, I have a bit of sparkling rosé here to toast you at the end, but I'm I'm gonna Ooh. be chugging my water and joining you on the wings until the end, for now. <laughs> <laughs> 
So this amazing partnership, I want to start off with asking, how did this begin? Where and how did you two meet? I believe you both have East Coast roots. Am I right in that? That's right. I, I basically grew up knowing about George, and it was two events in particular where I had the pleasure of meeting him. The first time was in Peterborough. He was doing um, a poetry reading. And uh, it was actually the poem that he, one of the poems that he recited, I to this day remember it. And it was the reason why I had the brilliant idea of asking him to get on board for this cabaret, um, the James Brown poem. And it defined so much about the evolution of black music. It said so much uh, about the merging of music, rhythm, and just uh, just text, just words, and um, the the influence it had on me. Then the second time that we met was, uh, and George, you can explain this symposium better than I, but it was in our my my dad's homeland and George's homeland of Halifax at the um, the African symposium. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, I got to say, Bo, um, I'm not sure exactly when it was that you sent me that uh, script that you were working on about Africville. I'm not sure it was before we met or after we met. But anyway, I certainly got to know you a little bit through your uh, work on on transforming uh, that uh, very important Canadian, African Canadian story, Africadian story, to use my word. Um, into a piece that could be performed. And I was honored and privileged to have a chance to uh, give you some editing suggestions for it. I'm sure there weren't many. I'm sure it was very fine as it was, but I really was touched by, by your interest in having me respond to it. It was wonderful, uh, a great critical analysis of the play, and it was very helpful in not only uh, furthering that play, but you know, I I go back to that letter um, every time, actually, I sit down to write a play. I go back to that uh, letter that you wrote. Give me a summary of the show, Bo. Like, what, what's, what is the show about or what do you want us to know about the show before we enter the theater? What is freedom about? Sure. So what it is, is it's basically 90 minutes of celebrating uh, the Black artists that are, are unsung heroes of... Uh, the music industry, Western music as we know it. So, um, you know, and it's such a broad, um, it's such a, it's such a broad subject because, uh, you know, black music has been a part of all of our lives. You know, it's everywhere, any, any dial that you turn to, any dial that you go to, it's, it's black music, baby. It's been influenced <laughs> by black music. Now, how do you summarize that in 90 minutes? Well, that's my, uh, that, that is what I am attempting to do. So what um, the, the public should expect, Alexis, when they leave is they're, they are gonna be educated and entertained and they're gonna be informed. And uh, those, those three things is what I really want to do, especially is uh, educate and entertain first and foremost. For sure. That sounds like a beautiful, again, like a celebration too, though, right? Like, where would we be without these roots? George, I don't want you to tease all of your program notes because I want to be <laughs> smacked with that brilliance when I'm when I'm ready to tuck into the show. But is there anything you want to say about like the history of the music and diving back into that content and getting to explore it or re-explore it? What was that like for you? Well, uh, thank you, Alexis. Uh, and again, it's a great privilege and pleasure to be able to partake in this discussion because everybody will benefit uh, from understanding the undercurrents of African influence in every single form of music in the West, including uh, forms that are often considered to be basically uh, a Caucasian, European, classical music, country and Western. They all have some black influence. They all do. So I, I think that if we can uh, scratch off just a little bit, just a tiny bit of the sugar frosting, 
of the of the of the Caucasian covering, which you know it's okay, it's that's sweet, it's nice, uh, and then get to some of the chocolate cake underneath. Uh, everybody's going to benefit, and our taste buds will benefit, and our dance moves will benefit, and our knowledge, especially, will will benefit, even politically as well. Who are some of your favorite Black artists, and why were they such an inspiration to you and your? I mean, both of your careers are so expansive, but in writing and performing or in composing or in reciting, um, how did they help shape your identity um, and, your, and your life? I, I will never forget my uh, encounter with Stevie Wonder. The album is Songs in the Key of Life. Yeah. I was seven years old. I was laying on my parents' shag carpet and I would always rifle through my dad's uh, albums and, you know, there was Miles Davis, uh, Four and More, and uh, Herbie Hancock on piano. So those two albums, Miles Davis and the, the, uh, the energy of that album, the experience of jazz music and these Black artists playing this fiery, uh, fast-paced music, it was so intellectual and so profound. And Stevie Wonder, Songs in the Key of Life, um, seven years old, it, it was, that was my first recollection of me uh, on my own reading. Uh, my dad's a minister, so we're, you know, at an early age, I was reading chapters from the Bible, but it was the lyrics from the liner notes from Songs in the Key of Life. And I would sit there and I would read every song and sing along to Stevie Wonder. And I just, I needed to do what he was doing and uh, discovering that he's a multi-instrumentalist and that he's blind. I was just like, this, this guy is magic. And I too want to do magic. One of the things why I was also honored to be asked to curate this uh, at Stratford is being a person of mixed race, having a white mother and a black father uh, I and being raised in Canada, my my social circle was not um, motivating me to surround myself with black music. And you know what I grew up with, what I was surrounded by was you know the radio, you know, and it was uh, the the majority was white music. And that there was a part of me as a person of mixed race that I was conflicted with the desire to perform uh, black music. And so to really now have the freedom and the license to do so, um, really uh, it, it's, 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 it's like I'm back to when I was seven and that having that personal, uh, that personal bond with uh, Stevie Wonder I'm now able to revisit that and and um, and you know uh, reclaim reclaim my roots. Beautiful, I love that. I mean, I very much feel Stevie Wonder's glow and energy through your through your art. So that I I love to picture you at age seven doing, and I love on your on the on the rug. Like I I can totally see that on the on the shag rug. You said yeah, the I'm scene perfectly. laying on my belly, my feet kicking up in the air, and just. Isn't she lovely? Oh. <laughs> love. How about you, George? Well, um, I love that album as as well. Songs in the Key of Life. Sir Duke comes to mind immediately. That's one of the ones that that I really liked as a teenager. And speaking of being a teenager, brings me uh, back to uh, one of the secret strengths of black music in general. We're talking about the spirituals or the blues or jazz or or early rock and roll and doo-wop and, and swing and, and house music and, and then ultimately rap. But really uh, the earlier forms, and for me that would be uh, the doo-wop and the soul and, and, and uh, rhythm and blues, uh, and of course the uh, spirituals and so on, um, is that it gave us, it gave me, it gave all of us a sense of strength that we could rely upon. As much as we might go out into the larger white world, the world where we might face prejudice, discrimination, uh, marginalization, suspicion, uh, and so on, there could also be this beautiful melody, 
of a hymn or a spiritual that would be there in the back of your mind that would give you strength so you could carry yourself forward into that world out of your own home, of your own neighborhood, and so on. The music carries the heritage, and it's a heritage of survival, a heritage of struggle, and a heritage of success, and, and, and a heritage of, of the spectacle, and a heritage of fun, uh, ultimately. Well, and I love the highlighting of the community of it. It brings people together like good art should, like theater does, um, and the way that we miss it so much that it, it, it is that closeness. It is that um, that reflex to move with it when it when it strikes you, when it brings you joy. That you can't you can't help but sing along or groove along to it. That that's the magic and the power of ma uh, of music. Um, I love that secret strength as well. That is such a stunning visual. I think in this past year of madness and all of this isolation that. Um, we need kindness more than anything. Um, but I wanna ask how you believe art and music can be the thing that can weave us together. And what, what does that look like for you? Like, I love that visual of, uh, of your friends and your family friends in your living room, but um, did that ever connect with you on how you could shape that and how you could make that happen in your own life or for other people in the future? Was that a big driving force for making art for either of you? So I actually want to start with something that you said, Bo, at, at the very beginning of our of our conversation this this afternoon, this evening, and and it has to it has to do with the influence of that music of those artists and so on. And, and of course, I was really struck by the image of you on the shag rug, uh, listening to Stevie Wonder blasting out of the stereo at you, and, and so on, uh, and teaching you something about yourself that you may not even have yet been old enough to really understand. And that would be true for me too. Um, but then at age 15, I decided I should be a songwriter because I, I, I uh, wanted to be popular in high school. I graduated, I was pretty popular in junior high school, grade nine. So going into grade 10, I was worried. I was like, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna be in a much different, bigger uh, pond, so to speak. How am I gonna get some attention for myself? I couldn't play basketball. I was told I couldn't sing. I was cut from the football team. So how on earth am I gonna get some attention as a young black kid who wants to be looked at by other kids? for crying out loud. So I thought, okay, I can't sing, I can't write music, I can't play any instruments, but I can write songs. I'm gonna try and write songs. So I started to write four songs every day. And as I was writing these songs, I was reading books about what you have to do to be a songwriter. And all these books said, you gotta be a poet. If you're gonna be a songwriter, you gotta be a poet. And I thought, oh, okay, I better start reading some poetry then. So I started reading poetry in order to become a better songwriter. And, and being a black kid from Halifax, the poetry that meant most to me was the poetry of the Harlem Renaissance, the poetry of the Black Arts Movement in the 1960s. And so many of these poets kept talking about the same jazz artists all the time. John Coltrane, Billie Holiday, Miles Davis. So then I had never really heard their music or their songs. So I started going out and buying them or renting them from, or not just renting them, but borrowing them from the library in order to become acquainted with this music. And then I started to write poetry in the idiom of the blues and of jazz and so on. And realizing that, that for me, that's where my art was going to have to find its base, as well as in the voice, the voices of the people around me, the vernacular, uh, the rich slang and jive and language and so on. The, you know, it's interesting going back to what George said about um, the music carries our heritage. Uh, and, you know, that's another thing I think the audience should expect to to know about our heritage in the 90 minute performance through the music it will guide them and give them more of an understanding of where where we've come from and who we are i started my career as a musician and playing in top 40 bands and stuff and if i was to play if i was to write my own music my cohorts would be uh, Caucasian and would be influenced by Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, or, you know, Duran Duran, or U2. 
and so I was always the odd man out where it's sort of clandestinely I'm I'm you know wanting to know more about Sam Cooke wanting to know more about Stevie Wonder but my my cohorts no one is of that era no one is of that genre so um you know it wasn't until I saw a play uh, by Andrew Moody, uh, Riot, and it was so uh, it was so ghetto and street. the The language was so street smart and, um, uh, shall I say, vernacular that it was. It was of my language. It was something I finally could understand. I remember looking at the program, you know, not only seeing black people on stage, but seeing that the playwright is of color and it just, it blew my mind. And that was, that was really the start of me wanting to be a playwright. And, but there was a, there was a musical, something musical hit me, the rhythm of the text, the language, uh, it also gave me a license to to explore black music. I just needed an identity. I just I just needed to identify with with someone of my color. So it was really my heritage. The more research I did about my heritage and where I was from, the closer I became. Uh, the, the the closer I came to performing black music. And to becoming an actor, and to and to write. So ultimately, um, in doing research of my heritage, I became an artist because I I it compelled me to write, and to write not only plays but to write music about uh, our about our struggle as an as a as a uh, as a race. So you bring up a really neat point there too of the the need to do research that it wasn't just readily visible or accessible that that comes with a consequence of having to do digging because it isn't popular at the front it is it is the chocolate cake under the vanilla cake it is the roots of the history but we don't talk about it as accessible as accessibly as other groups, music groups or art forms or archetypes that you're used to seeing on a stage. I My own story started with seeing an all black cast doing Janet Sears Harlem duet at Stratford when I was 16. And that being the, the light bulb in my head of, oh, I can do this because I didn't think I could. I'd never seen anyone who looked like me on there who was curvy and black or curvy and mixed until that show. So then I went, oh, I can, and then jumped forward into it. Um, and I, I, I love that, again, the importance of visibility, of seeing that record, of seeing Stevie Wonder, seeing Michael Jett, like seeing that image of that mirror reflection and saying, oh, I can, or, oh, there's more, or people were doing this, what else, who else is out there? That importance of symposiums and gathering and sharing, saying, yes, we can, yes, we do, yes, we already did but why aren't we talking more about it? Come celebrate with us. I wanna ask you both, what does freedom mean to you? Um, if you can, or feel like to you. Uh, of course, the title of your show, and there's a lot of weight behind that word, but maybe especially in this past year or within your art, what does freedom look like to you? One of the heritages, negative heritages of, of the transatlantic slave trade uh, which, while it was extremely negative, uh, helped build the Western world, especially as we know it now. And that should always be recognized. No one should ever uh, pretend that the West would be what it, what it is without the theft of indigenous land and the theft of African bodies to work that land in every way, shape, and possible. And then to produce new bodies uh, through black women for more labor exploitation. So those are the roots, the economic roots and social political roots of where we are uh, right now in time in, in North America, in Canada, in Stratford, and Niagara on the Lake, in Toronto, uh, and, and so on. And the history of our music is connected to the struggle against the exploitation and oppression that generations of us have endured. Uh, and that and that oppression and marginalization and segregation and racism 
also had an impact on our ability to form loving relationships with each other. So our history as a black people, as an African people is tied up also with the history of, of trying to find the freedom to actually love, not just the physical liberty uh, to, to escape the shackles and bondage of first slavery and then police oppression, it has to be said, in terms of the un, uh, uh, unwarranted and wanton incarceration of so many black people all over the world. And so the idea of freedom is not something simple for us. It's very complex and has a lot to do with mobility. Uh, so the idea, I, I, again, I think of the traveling jazz player. I think of the traveling blues player. I think of the traveling bands that bow yourself, that you've been part of and so on. Whether we recognize it or not, we are all part of a transatlantic history of mobility, of having to move. I've often said, and I'm sorry for putting on my scholar's hat here for a second, the most important right for Black people, when we think of civil liberties, civil rights, human rights, and, and so on, the most important rights, too, for Black people have been, historically, mobility. Because slavery meant you couldn't move. Colonialism meant you couldn't move. Imperialism meant you were zapped, you were frozen in place. And then when we were trying to move, you had police forces, you had Klansmen, you had terrorists trying to force you to stay where you were. So mobility is extremely important and our, and our music is all part of that. The ability to move your limbs, the ability to move in rhythm. When you think about all those anti-apartheid rallies in South Africa, what, uh, uh, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, one of the most striking images of a lot of those rallies was just the people. They were moving. They were moving. And when they're coming up against the South African police and so on. So we are a people, a, a group of human beings who have been rooted in notions of mobility, who have been frustrated in our mobility and our music and its rhythm and its beat and its percussiveness has always been about giving ourselves the right to move, the right to dance. So it's a big question you ask about, about freedom, but for me, it comes back. I think the music consistently says this over generations, over centuries. We want to be free, physically free. We want to be free to speak the language as we hear it and as we feel it. And we want to be free to love, to love our children, to love our spouses, and to, and to love our homes. Uh, where we can have a, a sense of stability and a base from which we can grow and form community and outreach to others. This is not about nationalism. This is about actually having a base from which you can grow and outreach to others, partly through the device of music. I love that. Well, music is freedom. To, to create music is to, is to breathe, is to live, is to be free. I love that. How about for you both? What Mr. Clark said, basically. Amen. You know, <laughs> amen indeed. Amen. Amen indeed. The, mo amen. the mobility, the mobility to inspire. You know, if it, it's uh, it's very hard to inspire if you can't if you can't speak your mind and if you can't, uh, you know, reach out to your neighbor. So I think freedom uh, that. To me, that defines it. The the, you know, everything that George said, you know, so eloquently. But yes, to love and to and to inspire through that loving, you can inspire. Um, and certainly, freedom is not, you know, to entertain, because you know we have all felt that where we're we're entertaining and we're doing our work, but we're not, we're not free you know, and our integrity is barely intact. That's one of the things to also in the 90 minute cabaret to explore that difference between entertain, the entertainment industry, being in the entertainment industry, but not having a full grasp of freedom, for not, not having that full experience of freedom, to be paid as an artist, as an entertainer, but not have that freedom and that's something that we'll also explore in the music. Being told what to sing or what isn't popular or what versus no, do do what's popular. And that'll sell more. The product versus the art versus the, 
That's always the debate, isn't it? Money, money. It all it all just comes down to money at the end of the day, doesn't it? My Lord. But that idea too that to sing and music is also education. So I wanted to ask, what is next for you two? You've begun this beautiful dive together. We've had this beautiful discussion and you're picking up each other's words. I feel like maybe there is a show in the future for you two. Would that, <laughs> would that ever happen? Eh? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm open uh, to uh, that possibility. Absolutely. Okay. I, I, it would be an honor. I would be, wow. Um, and you know, there's, you know, there's numerous stories, uh, I'm sure we could, uh, write together and topics like, holy smokes, that would be a great collaboration. And I'm not going to pretend when I first, uh, suggested to Stratford to get George on board, I was hoping, uh, you know, deep down, I, I was planting that seed with the hopes that uh, in the future, you know, uh, I would knock on his door and we would uh, make something happen. Wonderful. Well, it looks like the curtain's gonna come up on your show soon. Uh, before I let you two go for the show, I wondered if I could ask if there is anything that you've been most grateful for in this time, for the show, in this moment, what should we, what should we cheers to right now? Cheers to uh, a better future, reimagining our integrity as a race to the beauty of music, the power of music. Spiritually, I have been comforted uh, by the love of family, friends, my companion, uh, other artists, uh, uh, students, uh, colleagues, uh, neighbors, and the other side of the coin, of the social political coin, is the spiritual coin. And the fact that has again been proven to us that without those personal relationships and interconnections and respect, deep respect for them, we cannot survive. Here, here. Cheers to you Yay! both. <laughs> Cheers to making... Cheers to making art, to gathering together for freedom. Cheers to freedom. And again, this idea of secret strengths, that, that is going to stick with me. Cheers to you both. And I cannot wait Thank to you, see Alexa. your show. Cheers. Thank you so, so much for joining us for this musical episode. Now make sure you check out Ajoma's episodes covering the plays of the 2021 Stratford Festival season. Stay well till we meet at the theater in person or digitally again. Cheers.